Right now, as I'm sure you're aware, farmers across the Western world are protesting against the green policies that their respective governments are imposing upon them. Policies that the farmers claim are completely handcuffing their ability to grow food. And while the farmers in Europe right now are getting a lot of attention, well, the farmers right here in America are also getting tied up by green policies which threaten their livelihoods. But what's perhaps shocking to a lot of people is that even though on the surface these all appear to be very different battles, well, they're actually not. Even though in Germany they're fighting against diesel subsidies, in the Netherlands they're fighting against forced appropriations, in Ireland the farmers are fighting against the culling of cattle, and here in the U.S. farmers are fighting against this endless red tape from the Bureau of Land Management, even though the details in every country are different, when you look beneath the surface you actually find that what's truly happening is that directives from the international level, from international organizations like the United Nations, are actually getting trickled down and becoming concrete policies at the ground level in all these different countries. And so while we were filming our documentary, No Farmers, No Food, we had the opportunity to sit down and speak with Mr. Craig Rucker, the executive director of a phenomenal organization called CFACT, the Committee for a Constructive Tomorrow. And during the interview, Mr. Craig Rucker explained to us in very great detail how what's taking place in all these different countries, while again seemingly disparate, is actually the concrete manifestation of a single ideology that comes down from the very top and is then implemented at the local level by these different NGOs and these organizations who happen to be ideologically aligned with the green agenda. An agenda, I should mention, that Mr. Craig Rucker says is not really about the environment, but rather it's all about control. Now, in the actual documentary, we used only a few bits and pieces of the interview, but today, for the first time ever, I'd like to present to you the entirety of my interview with Mr. Craig Rucker. Take a listen. All right, Craig, can you please uh, briefly introduce yourself and your organization? Sure. My name is Craig Rucker. I am the president of the Committee for a Constructive Tomorrow, or CFACT. CFACT is an organization that's been around since 1985. We work on issues of environment and development. Uh, we have a free market perspective and one that also advocates for sound science, which makes us a little different than some of the other environmental groups which we would claim have a more big government or liberal viewpoint. Mm. So uh, what, what made you back in 85 start up this organization? I started up this organization back in 1985 for the purposes of trying to bring a reasonable voice or a voice of reason, I guess you could say, to the environmental cause. Uh, I myself grew up in Buffalo, New York, and I grew up in a rural area outside of Buffalo, New York, where we chopped wood to heat our home. Uh, we hunted and did things of that sort. Uh, when I went to college, uh, I was in Albany, New York, I met a lot of my friends from New York City who chastised me as being unenvironmental. Uh, because of my conservative viewpoints and these are people who didn't really know the difference between a possum and a skunk telling me somebody from the country that we were not uh, and my family was not people who were intimately equated with the environment I found that peculiar uh, I also noted that if you look around the country in the red districts around the country those are people who live close to nature they also tend to be people who vote Republican and have conservative values so my partner and I, a business partner named David Rothbard, decided to start CFAC to bring a voice of reason on these issues, uh, one that would be conservative, free market oriented. And we brought together a board of scientists and academics in 1985 and started CFAC. The kind of the overarching theme of the documentary is how these globalist agendas in the UN and the WEF translate into real concrete on the ground policies in different countries in Sri Lanka, Australia, the Netherlands, Canada, and the US. Um, speaking of the US, can you sort of trace it out? How does, how do rather these you know, globalist policies, how do they actually trickle down into real on the ground uh, policies that are implemented here in the States? The policies that have been developed by the United Nations trickle down to the United States by way of uh, ordinances, laws, and that that are put in by bureaucrats, typically at the sub-national level. Uh, I've been involved in this issue going back to 1986, really, uh, and this is a time when sustainable, sustainable development actually started to take off, when Gro Brundtland, the premier of Norway, coined the term sustainable development in a book called Our Common Future. A few years later, the UN met in Rio de Janeiro in 1992 and actually signed a document called Agenda 21. This document 
uh, which was signed by leaders around the world, was supposed to be a non-binding document, but contained in it principles of sustainable development and how they are to be implemented on the local level. An organization was also created around that time called ICLE, the International Council on Local Environmental Initiatives. Its purpose was to try to implement these laws on the local level. ICLE chapters sprung up around the entire United States with the purpose of doing that. And they worked with commissioners in uh, local towns and cities to try to implement sustainable objectives into them. And they've been incredibly effective. So that is how they're actually being uh, put into law around our country. Well, so, so you're saying at the UN level, um, there's Agenda 21, but then in order to implement Agenda 21 throughout the different nations, this other organization called ICLE uh, sprang up. Are the people who work at ICLE, or the people who direct ICLE, how are they related to the people at the UN? Are, are they the same people, or they, do, do they just share the same ethos and worldview? How are they related? No, they actually uh, quite often have overlapping membership. Uh, many of them are, are people who work, and in fact, their conferences often happen at the same time. For example, there'll be a World Summit on Sustainable Development in Rio. Concurrent with that is an ICLE conference going on in Belo Horizonte, Brazil. I happen to attend that one. So they do work in conjunction. They make sure that they, uh, the members of one can easily make it to the other meetings. Uh, you'll meet them at the other meetings. But I want to caution, it's not just ICLE. There are, there's a whole vast network of NGOs that are out there all uh, working to put the what are now 17 sustainable development goals into law in the local uh, region and the local municipalities, townships, state law, etc. Do you have any specific examples of this happening in the U.S., maybe in a certain state, in a certain uh, particular agency or particular law? Absolutely. Uh, one of them was one that I worked on very closely with Tom DeWeese in the American Policy Center probably about 10 years ago. And it was an effort to try and put the Chesapeake Bay Ordinance using the watersheds to close off development in Loudoun County, Virginia. And uh, if you look at one of the uh, goals of sustainable development, I believe it's goal number 12, which deals with that, or it might be six, deals with water management and uh, resource use. This is extremely consistent with it. The other reason we know there's a link is one of the people that we were able to follow actually went to training in ICLEI and then came to the Chesapeake uh, Bay Ordinance controversy and was somebody hired by Loudoun County to implement it. Uh, fortunately, we got tipped off by it and we were able to make an issue of that individual and also the whole issue of how uh, private property rights would be trampled to the point that you couldn't even put a swing set in your backyard without getting a uh, permit approval. Uh, can you just uh, like, sort of lay out what was really happening there for the people who might have never heard of this controversy? This controversy basically was to try and use riparian waterways and uh, ditches and things like that and put easements on the side of them. This is very similar to other initiatives that have been done around the country. Uh, we have something called WOTUS in the United States, same thing. To protect streams and rivers, they want to have these easements on the side of them where you, no development, can't use cattle, you can't uh, put any permanent structures on them without government permit, and that government permit's hard to achieve. Well, Loudoun County is one of the more populous counties in Virginia, and this uh, would have been a complete thwarting of any development in that region. And so we wound up working with some property activists to be able to bring attention to the fact that it was so onerous, you, as I said, you couldn't even put in a swing set uh, without getting a government permit. This upset all the people there because it literally choked off development to the entire region that they wound up voting out the, boor uh, the Board of Supervisors for Loudoun County and uh, putting in ones that would not put that in and that whole ordinance went down to crashing defeat. But that would be an example of a type of sustainable development policy that you'll see originate at kind of a, a higher level or the idea, uh, but being administered by local individuals to get it uh, put into law in a community. Wow, so, so you're saying that one of the examples um, of, of ICLE and these other organizations implementing this agenda in the U.S. is that they use waterways 
as, as the nexus, and then, they, and then they block off the area surrounding the waterways so that people cannot develop them. Is that the case? That's exactly what they do, yes. And in fact, that's really kind of what they're trying to do with the WOTUS, the Waters of the United States, which is something the Biden administration is trying to put in right now, which is basically twofold. One is to try and protect these riparian waterways with uh, easements on the side of them. The other way is to uh, actually uh, define what is a wetland. The original law in the Clean Water Act said it had to be a navigable waterway. And most people think of a navigable waterway as something that maybe has a boat on it and you can you know, take a ship down. Uh, that's not the way it's been defined, however. And, uh, and through the years, that has tightened to the point that literally a ditch could be a waterway. Heck, a mud puddle could be a waterway. And uh, bureaucrats could use that to basically choke off development, stop uh, you know, cattle farming, cattle ranching, because of the fact that this is a waterway that deserves protection, and uh, also implement more ambitious programs to take over massive amounts of land, like the 30 by 30 initiative that Biden is putting through. Starting in 1992, this, this idea of sustainability began to get implemented. If you, if you can just simply uh, trace it down from, like, from 1992, how did we get to 2022? Like, can, can you give the, the big milestones? To give you the milestones that are before, because it wasn't like it came out of the blue in 1987. This was a, uh, a thing that grew out of first Paul Ehrlich in the 1960s, had a book called The Population Bomb, where he said there's too many people. And uh, that was a bestseller in 1969. It was a development of something called conservation biology that started to, to come into being in the late 1970s, early 1980s. And one of the fastest growing movements in the scientific community was something called conservation biology. Out of that idea came the idea of sustainable development, which was embraced by Gro Brundtland in 1987, publication of a book called Our Common Future. Now that book, launched officially sustainable development. It was picked up in the Rio Earth Summit of uh, 1992 in Rio de Janeiro and actually codified in Agenda 21. From there it grew to be the Millennium Goals uh, around 2000. Uh, the future we want uh, and also uh, the Agenda 2030 came out shortly after the 20th anniversary of that 1992 it was called Rio Plus 20 in 2012 down in Rio de Janeiro. And from there grew the 17 sustainable development goals that we see prominently talked about today. I guess my, my first question is maybe to someone who doesn't understand how all these different you know, agendas and plans interrelate to another. Can you explain how Agenda 21 relates to Agenda 2030 and Agenda 30 by 30? How, how do they all interrelate? All these different plans, Agenda 21, Agenda 2030, relate by virtue of the fact they're the growth of the same agenda. Uh, really taking you back to the beginning, it started with uh, Gro Brundtland making the comment about sustainable development in 1987 with a book called Our Common Future, leading to the uh, UN Earth Summit and the codification of the idea of sustainable development in a document called Agenda 21 that was signed by the world leaders back then, including George H. Bush. That grew over a period of time to become what was called the Millennium Goals and later became Agenda 2030 around the time of the uh, second Rio or 20th anniversary of the Rio Earth Summit in 2012-2013 timeframe. Today it's largely referred to as Agenda 2030, but it's the same principles and just the evolution of those principles over time. So Agenda 21 really has just grown into being Agenda 2030. Taking it back here in the States, you have Agenda 30 by 30. Can you explain to the audience what is that? The 30 by 30 uh, land grab is what we like to call it. This is an idea of taking one third of the United States and essentially turning it into a national park. Uh, this has long been a goal of the uh, deep green movement, dating back even to the 1992 Rio Earth Summit when there was something put out called the Biodiversity Treaty, which also called for a third of the Earth's habitat to be set aside for nature. This is all part of a deep green ecologist belief that uh, there's too much development and that nature is best managed if we just take man out of the equation and leave it in its natural pristine state. 
So uh, what we're seeing right now with the 30 by 30 is an effort to use existing laws and rules, whether it's WOTUS being one, the Endangered Species Act perhaps being another one, uh, the roadless rule, which is prohibiting roads from going into wilderness areas, all designed to take man out of wilderness and even depopulate our rural areas and return it back to wilderness because in their view, this is what will heal Mother Earth from mankind's footprint. So, so I know here in the U.S., uh, approximately 60% of the land uh, at least is owned by private citizens. So is, is it the case that they're looking to take some of that land uh, and claim it over into this, into this 30 by 30 agenda and make it wild? Or are they looking to take the land that they already own and, and change it? I, I'd say that of that 60% that is currently owned privately, they would like to see a lot more of it managed publicly. The way that the uh, Greens and those who are working in the Biden administration and want to try to convert this land from private land into public land and then convert it from there into wilderness land is to try and do a, a number of different things. One thing they'd use is conservation easements. So what they'll do is they'll allow you to own it privately, but you sign an agreement with a green group perhaps, like the Nature Conservancy, and promise not to develop your land. But it's not just a promise you would make, it's for future owners of that land can no longer develop on it either. So in a sense, even though it's privately owned per se, uh, the government's getting the use out of it because it's basically remaining wild. Other cases, uh, what people are doing is they're selling their private land to groups like the Nature Conservancy, who in turn then perhaps in some cases sell it to the state. So yes, there's a concerted effort to do that. Is, is Agenda 30 by 30, is it something that's on the books in the U.S. or is it sort of an overarching goal that people just sort of use as a touch as a touchstone when they're you know implementing different policies within the sub agencies I, I would look at agenda 2030 as kind of being a template or a blueprint uh, there is no specific law that says this is agenda 2030 we're going to put it and codify it in law what they do is they take the principles of agenda 2030 uh, which are things like we need to stop development we need to do measures to limit carbon emissions uh, we need to put in depopulation policies or uh, grow things organically. Those are the principles and they leave it up to the people who are their advocates to go into the uh, local and state areas and find laws to make those things happen. So uh, they're really just principles that guide the activists. What if somebody's watching this interview and they're, and they're listening to you and they're thinking, you know what, I actually agree with the goal of Agenda 30 by 30 because I would want to see more land return to wilderness in order to sort of offset the land that's being used by farming, industrial farming, and all the nitrogen and the carbon they emit. What would you tell that person who, who thinks that way? Well, you would be moving humanity. If you want to get rid of all the uh, industrial development, you want to get rid of agriculture and everything, back a few hundred years. Life was short and brutish. People died young back then. People today are living longer and healthier lives than at any point in human history based on the fact we have modern farming, modern agriculture, the air that we're breathing today is cleaner than it was a couple hundred years ago because of technology and industrialization. These things have been a boon for mankind. Modern farming has allowed us actually to reduce the amount of land that we need to farm on, which is good for both man because it produces much more food than we used to produce back in the 1950s, 40s, and etc., and also put aside more for nature. So in fact, I would say that this is a step backwards that uh, man by going and taking up, uh, or these activists by taking up all this land are actually doing things that neither help man nor nature. And as a matter of fact, if you're going to look at some of these specific things that are being done by this, you'll find that our forests by not being managed and just left it in the pristine au naturel condition uh, are being devastated by catastrophic wildfire. Uh, unless you allow timbering in that area, this is a fuel load that just bursts at times and destroys vast acres and wildlife in those areas. Streams fill in with silt. Unless man dredges them and manages these things in a stewardship way, will choke off uh, uh, habitat for salmon and other suckerfish and things of that sort. So 
I would argue that actually this is a step backwards. We need to be able to allow uh, man to steward nature, not take this hands-off approach and just set it aside uh, where I think nature would struggle. So, so are, are you trying to say that the, there's a twofold problem. One is that with less farmland, there would be less food generally for the population. Correct. And then also their stated goal would not be achieved because the land left to the wilderness is not is not even taken care of as well. It doesn't achieve the goal that they even state they want to achieve as land that's actually managed by a private owner. Is that, is that the case? Exactly. And as a matter of fact, you find uh, that dual thing that you just talked about is uh, manifest if you look at privately managed lands versus publicly managed lands. There's no contest. Privately managed lands are uh, much better for wildlife. They take care of their property because there's a private interest involved to make sure it's managed okay. Uh, public lands, there's an old saying that when it's owned by everybody, nobody takes responsibility. Well, that's the case with our national parks. We have all sorts of things going on in our national parks with beetle infestations, pine bark, um, woolly egglets uh, eating up trees down in the southeast. Uh, as I mentioned before, streams and silt being filled in in rivers, catastrophic wildfires. When it's not managed by man, nature degrades, and uh, that's not good for either people or the planet. But let me ask you then in, in this case, because I mean, you have access to the same data as, as they do, as the people who are implementing these policies. Is it that they're reading the data in a different way than you, or are they choosing to ignore it, or do they have some kind of other intention that this environmental movement is just, is just a cover for? What, what do you make of that? The motivations of those who are pushing this agenda, I think, are kind of off base. It's tough to read. Whenever you're trying to interpret why other people are doing what they're doing, you get yourself in trouble. But having gone to some 30 UN conferences around the world dating back to the 1990s, I would say a good many of them are just misinformed. Uh, they bought the, drank the Kool-Aid, I guess you could say, and really believe what they're doing helps the planet. But I'm not so sure that's true with a lot of the leaders of this movement. Uh, many of them tend to emulate countries like China and back in my day, the former Soviet Union, which have abysmal environmental records. You look at the Soviet Union, you had Chernobyl, you had all toxic waste polluting the Danube River and things of that sort. And yet to hear the environmentalists speak, the former Soviet Union was a wonderful eco paradise and the United States needs to be more like them. Well, after the Berlin Wall fell, they're no longer looking to that. They're joining the bandwagon saying, oh, they did it wrong. They're now gravitating toward China. And I'm going, China, seriously? This is a country that has massive pollution problems. They don't seem to care about rivers and lakes and streams. There's all sorts of toxins pouring into them. But try and find a person who advocates for the 30 by 30 or anything uh, that deals with clean air and clean water to criticize China, and you'll be searching a long time. Well, I really wonder why that is. Is it because they believe that that sort of policy implementation where the, you have such a strong central government that's that's the end goal and if they had that apparatus they could do it differently than the Chinese Communist Party so they don't want to criticize China is, is that the reason or is there something else I'd like to say that but uh, in actuality I would say their envy of China is more to do with their control over their population and control over the politics than it has to do about the environment I almost in looking at this it looks like the environment's a tool to achieve power more than it is an end goal of itself to actually protect nature. So what, what do you think the ultimate goal of the globalists are is uh, in terms of implementing these climate policies? Well, I think we see what the ultimate goal is. You see it with the COVID lockdowns, for example. Uh, now they're talking about climate lockdowns. They want people to be less in number, living in their own little bubble, not driving cars, eating uh, meatless hamburgers, and living a whole lifestyle that really uh, sounds kind of sad. And uh, in their mind, this is what will heal Mother Nature. And if we're gonna have some future, uh, we all need to ascend to this level. So what would you tell someone that actually agrees with that? Where, where they might say, well, you know, these globalists, they sit at the very top, they have access to the most amount of information and access to the best 
sci people in science and, and, and all this, they just have like this, this vantage point of being able to look down and they're seeing something, you know, on the horizon, they're very worried about it and they want to save the earth because even if, let's say, if they don't implement these, these policies, our grandkids won't have an earth to inherit and so they're willing to take control of all the resources and, and implement some, some stewardship program that will actually, at the very least, deliver something to, the, to our grandkids. What, what do you make of, uh, of that type of an argument? You know, that is a, a possibility. I do think that those who go to Davos, uh, I mean, there are people like Bill Gates and, you know, all the others that uh, have money galore, probably have in their mind that they are this elite that is thinking more broadly than the rest of us and therefore knows better than the average person how to manage the Earth's resource and that. But I think history is f chock full of people who thought that elites could make these types of decisions for the little people. It's never ended well. Uh, and I don't think it's gonna end well in this particular case either. So uh, my, my caution would be on that is that they got it wrong many times in the past. You see on the uh, whole climate change issue, for example, the elite said that by now Florida would be underwater, New York City would be underwater. Uh, you had fantastic predictions of m so many more people dying in the United States from COVID lockdowns and uh, all sorts of things. They've been wrong, wrong, wrong. And you gotta wonder at what point do we stop believing them and trust the common man, which is kind of what America was founded on, uh, to be his own guide into the future. I actually wanted to circle back a bit to Agenda uh, 30 by 30, because you mentioned and you uh, kind of explicated on the way that the uh, WOTUS is being used, the Water Conservation Act, uh, but you also mentioned the Endangered Species Act, how that's also used uh, to, take, to take land. Can you sort of uh, explain that a bit more? Absolutely. What you'll find with the Endangered Species Act is that in order to protect a species, sometimes you have to protect habitat. That's land. So in many cases, when, the, uh, when you want to do development, for example, in uh, some place in Colorado that requires mining, you'll see environmentalists employ the Endangered Species Act or the sage grouse, let's say, to stop uh, uh, coal uh, mining or uh, uranium mining or things of that sort and the courts will deny the mine or the coal plant from being built based on the fact that you know a species may be impacted by that in fact the endangered species act doesn't necessarily require that a species be on the land it's just that it's the habitat that a endangered species might one day want to take up residence on that might be sufficient in order to choke off an area uh, that from all sorts of development what makes Agenda 21 slash Agenda 2030 now today uh, very dangerous is they use the existing laws in the nation states that signed on to subscribe to this in whatever capacity to implement their agenda. In the case of the United States, when we signed on uh, and they wanted to implement it, they looked at what laws currently exist. The Clean Water Act was passed in 1972. The Endangered Species Act was passed in 1973. Let's use these laws and tighten them or tweak them in order to achieve the goals. Uh, of course, they'll do differently in Canada as they would in Mexico, as they would in Europe, based on the laws that are there. And that's what makes this uh, whole Agenda 2030 a very dangerous thing, is that it doesn't take one form. It's not like one bill or one law that's universal for every country around the world, it adapts to whatever country it's in. Wow. So with, with Agenda 30 by 30 specifically, once they, they take this 30% of the land and, and devote it to wildness, uh, what then? Are they done? Are, are, they, are they gonna pack up and, and go home? Or are, is there a next step? Uh, what, what do you think about that? If they achieve trying to put one third of the United States as a nature park, and they actually achieve their goal of 30% of the U.S. land uh, into the wild, no, I don't think for a second they're gonna stop there. The history has always been that uh, with those on the left that you give them an inch, they take a mile. So I would anticipate that uh, some of the more, in fact, we see some from some of the radical writings of those on the Green Movement that they're talking 50, 60, 70%. Uh, he was talking about radical reductions in population. I, I think it was um, uh, Ted Turner who long ago said he'd like to see the world reduced to 500 million people. I mean, we're at 8 billion right now. So yes, I think among the more radical extreme Greens, they would like to see America as it was prior to 1492. 
And, and so besides this land reclamation, there's more and more policy, uh, policies that are going into effect that have the climate as the basis for, for the reason for being. Like for instance, there's um, a new policy of needing to put trackers inside of new, new vehicles after a certain year so that you can actually track how, how long you're driving for and where you are on the road. Um, there's a move right now uh, that was being discussed at the World Economic Forum of a, uh, uh, of a system that could actually track an individual's carbon footprint. Not, not a company's, but an actual individual's carbon footprint. And so if these policies go into effect, because there's kind of broader policies that might, let's say, reduce the amount of meat that you can buy. And so they change the environment in order to change the person. But there's also policies going into effect that would track an individual to such a level that it's almost like controlling a person at that, at that individual level. What do you think the society would look like if all these policies were to actually go into effect and would continue down this road? This whole idea of tracking individuals, I think, is very dangerous. I've been to some sustainable cities conferences. They actually exist and they meet every year. Uh, I've been to one in Melbourne, Australia. This goes back to maybe 2018 thereabouts, where Al Gore actually spoke at it. And Essentially, they were lauding, again, communist China for tracking its citizens and having these surveillance cameras around town and thinking of the various uses that this might provide for uh, getting societies to become more green. You know, what if we put surveillance cameras and we see somebody throwing a plastic bottle into the regular garbage can instead of the recycling bin? Could we find him? You know, what if we see people that are driving the wrong sorts of vehicles? Uh, you know, the possibilities are endless in order to get a green, almost police state going. And that's uh, something that was being talked about then. And, uh, you know, so from my perspective, the, this is all consistent. We already are, have some credit card companies, I think it's MasterCard now, talking about a carbon footprint type credit card where when you charge too much for gasoline or too many plane flights or things that may emit too much carbons, they'll stop your credit card from working and you won't be able to do anything unless you purchase more credits or maybe you just don't do anything for the rest of the month until you get your next allotment. Wow. So you've been going to these conferences for several decades now. Is there any even discussion among, among, the, among the, I guess, globalist crowd there of like a bit of pushback because these these policies sure i mean in theory if you think the world is ending and the climate is the biggest crisis you think okay we have to do this but is there any pushback on the other side saying hey the like the the implementation of this would create an effective police state where people have to ask a bureaucrat to you know scratch their own heads is there is that even like a, a point of discussion at these conferences is it a point of discussion that we might create a police state if we actually put all this together? I would say no. Uh, and I think the reason for that is most of the people attending these climate summits think they're exempt from any of the mandates that they're going to pass on to the rest of the people. They're a privileged elite. And so they take private jets uh, to the UN conferences. They have champagne parties. They take private limos to the various events. And then they talk about, you know, what sort of restrictions need to go on for the rest of humanity. You won't see them taking public transportation. You won't see them eating meatless burgers, except for maybe a PR event. Uh, so no, I don't think that they actually think any of these things will affect them personally. My last question, I guess Agenda 30 by 30 is a very broad, broad agenda in general, right? That has many different manifestations, like a hydro with many heads. But, be, but besides that broad implementation, is there any other specific implementation of Agenda 21 within the U.S.? Specific, uh, I would say that what other rules should you look at that are actually being used against farmers, being used against ranchers and uh, food production and all that that reflect the views that are in the Agenda 2030? I would say you have a roadless rule, you have the Endangered Species Act, you have the wetlands rules. Uh, these are prominent ones that are being used even now by the Biden administration. Beyond that, I would say a lot of local ordinance rules, things that deal with watersheds in a particular region or hiking paths or things of that sort. They're not exactly the glamorous issues, uh, but they're ones that may impact a lot of people in a particular local area. So I, I, uh, I wouldn't say in a broad swath way that there's any uh, other major ones other than perhaps the Paris Accord, which I think uh, is an all-encompassing one that uh, uh, could really impact pretty much every issue. 
you had that quote uh, in an article written by Alex Newman in the Epic Times where you said the true intentions of globalist policies is to strip people of their sovereignty. Do you still believe that that is the true intention? What, what, what is the true intention in your mind of the globalists in terms of these policies? I think the uh, full intention behind all of these globalist policies is to rob the sovereignty of both the individuals and to the nations around the world and really put it under the authority of global elites. And so I, I think that that is the ultimate aim of all these things. People will be robbed of their sovereignty because they won't be able to choose uh, what sort of meat they can eat, what temperature they can have for in their own home, and that'll be regulated, uh, you know, smart meters, uh, what type of cars they drive, uh, how many children they have. All these types of things are incorporated in a very dangerous Agenda 2030 that I think people are, are largely ignorant of. Can wrap up. Thank you so much.